I'm Catherine Arndt, the Chief of the VLGA Connect Studio. Welcome to today's episode, brought to you by the VLGA, your councillor support network and the national broadcaster on all things local government. Hello and welcome to the Governance Update, TGU, proudly brought to you by the Victorian Local Governance Association with the much appreciated support of Hunt and Hunt lawyers. And in no longer breaking news, I'm Steve Cooper. Um, Chris Eddy is away on assignment and will be back this week. And it's a big International Women's Day edition and therefore it's only right and proper that first of all, we welcome Julie Reid. Hi, Julie. <laughs> Very nice, Steve. And you know, it's interesting, uh, International Women's Day is really important to me. And these are the times actually that I miss not working in local government. You know, being in an organisation when there's all these women around you that are celebrating International Women's Day and when you're celebrating on your own as a consultant, it's not quite the same. So a big shout out to all those amazing women in local government Um uh, for International Women's Day and, um, you know, and I do miss you all, you know, not being, you know, in the office with you, uh, you know, as much as what I used to have. So, but anyway, but look, I've had a, I had a great week, Steve, and I've been out to East Gippsland this week and a uh, fantastic uh, uh, assignment out there. So uh, a shout out to East Gippsland Council. Oh, good stuff, Julie, but at least you get to choose where and with whom you celebrate um, events <laughs> like that. And is it just a reminder about it's not just roads, rates and rubbish, that there's real social capital that uh, we work on in local government. And speaking of um, social capital and making sure we do things legally, properly and ethically, welcome Tony Rownick from Hunt and Hunt Lawyers. G'day, Steve and Chris. And, uh, sorry, <laughs> what did I say? Steve and Julie. And, and um, um, again, yeah, we had, we had plenty of those um, um local uh international women's day events this week it's um at, uh, externally in the office and uh, um and in internally as well but steve i noticed you've got is that the purple color for international women's day you're wearing that or is that just a fluke um there's two things tony i did when i put this shirt on um notice that yes it is the iwd colors but also it just so happens i like this shirt <laughs> well done <laughs> Thank you. And thank you for noticing, Tony. OK, so let's go and we'll start on the International Women's Day um, theme. And, and Julie, none of us were able to be there, but the VLGA earlier in the week hosted an event where the most updated report of the longitudinal study by Professors Leah Rippiner and Andrea Carson was released um, at a very well attended event um, with some um, substantial recommendations. Yeah, I believe so, Steve. And uh, these are Professors uh, Rupiner and uh, Carson. Um, and I believe that what's happened is that La Trobe University have teamed up, I think, uh, with uh, Melbourne University, and they've uh, done this uh, significant amount of work. And um, it's interesting because uh, what they've focused on is uh, they have interviewed 19 councillors, uh, councillors and ex-councillors, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, women, that is, and uh, had some really significant findings from these women that they've interviewed. Uh, so a couple of the key recommendations, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later as well, but um, is uh, to provide better support for caregiving to ensure that care isn't a barrier to women running for council and staying on council if they are elected, because there seems to be some issues still around in that space. I didn't realise that there were issues. Um, I thought that, you know, women were being provided for for childcare to be able to do the role as a councillor, but didn't realise that we're, there were still some barriers there. So who would have thought, about... sorry, Julie, to interrupt, who would have thought that um, the one of the findings was that uh, women who avail themselves of um, the childcare allowances and so on might be somehow shamed for doing so. That's right, Steve, and that's what's happening. They're being shamed and they're being targeted when it comes to the budget process and saying, look at the cost that you are, you know, the cost burden that you have on the organisation. So that's not really very positive to hear that, Steve. I was a bit surprised about that and really disappointed. Um, 
The second key recommendation was, um, you know, creating this greater oversight to stamp out the incivility, bullying and, and harassment issues. So there's a lot of this stuff still going on, Steve, and it's just you know, so, so frustrating to hear that so much, much of it still goes on and uh, they've had some real stories being told, et cetera, and, um, you know, they're sort of calling on now, you know, what kind of uh, things need to be put in place to be able to stamp this out um, and there's been a um, an interesting report on ABC this week where, you um, where uh, Professor Carson has been interviewed. So um, happy to outline a little bit of that as well. Yeah, let's, um, Julian, I should just in, um, before we go to that ABC um, report, note that the VLGA is recorded in the um, the papers and the application uh, for that particular research as a support organisation. And um, in fact, uh, the, it, the, the links will be in the show notes, but the VLGA media release regarding that event will, will contain a copy of the report um, if anyone would like to uh, would like to have a read of that. And it's certainly a worthwhile document. So let's go to the statewide morning show in response to that report. That was yesterday, the 7th of March, hosted by Jonathan Kendall. Um, and Jonathan, into, and it's at the start of the show and goes for about 20 minutes if anyone wants mm. to hear it. And we'll, we'll post the show notes. But Jonathan Kendall interviewed firstly Professor Andrea Carson and then uh, Ruth McGowan, who has done a power of work in this particular space. So what were your thoughts, Julie? Yeah, well, it was interesting because they, they opened it by saying that this is a focus on bullying at work. And so that was the theme that ran throughout the whole program. So Professor Carson, as we said, that was from La Trobe University, um, surveyed these 19 local female or ex-female counsellors um, and they, they covered metro, rural and regional areas um, and they said many of them have been the victim of harassment and bullying and they said it was part of a four-year project. So the purpose was to look at... Um, also why we don't have gender parity in local government. And this is something that Ruth has been also um, pushing and we'll hear a little bit about um, what Ruth's been saying today because she's uh, released a, um, a bit of a uh, report back today on LinkedIn. So but with the report, one of the key findings um, uh, was that attrition in local government was due to the experience of that hostility and the instability, which was gender related. Um, so experience of gender abuse. And that's why councillors are sort of giving up their, their role because of that, that reason, which is really sad to hear. So they've been experiencing insults and harassment um, based on them being women, basically. And they said it comes from online, it comes from social media, and it comes face to face. So it's not just in one area, it's it's across the board that they're experiencing this. Um, and they're saying that it's not only from their fellow councillors, but it's also from the public. So mm -hmm bit of both, but they're saying they're actually experiencing it more from their fellow councillors, which again is a little bit sad to hear. Um, so they started to talk about some solutions and uh, some of these sound very familiar. Um, you know, things like the uniform code of conduct across all councils. We know that that's on the cards anyway. Um, greater powers to the local government inspectorate to dish out the consequences to the repeat offenders. So they talked a little bit about that, but anyway. But if we talk about this parity, there was this talk about this parity of female versus male councillors across um, across local government. And in Victoria, we're, we're actually not doing too bad. We're doing better than some states. I think uh, we've got about 43%, I think, yes. of female councillors at the moment. So better than some states, but we could, you know, certainly improve on that. Um, and, um, you know, they, they talked about this issue of the childcare and the, um, the challenges of, um, of, you know, young women in particular signing up to become counsellors uh, when they've got these childcare pressures. And, you know, um, sure, we've got provisions for them to be paid for childcare, but if you're getting, if you're getting bullied or harassed or, um, you know, targeted because you're using resources to be able to have childcare while you're a counsellor, then that's 
that's not good either because then they're not going to step forward and put up their hands. So they're saying there's a real issue around these younger women, you know, coming to the table and becoming becoming counsellors. And we've seen some really, really powerful, really successful young women being counsellors um, across the state in various councils. And so, you know, we want to be able to see that diversity coming out in, in council. So there's a big goal for gender parity and um, that's by next year. Um, the state is hoping um, for there to be that gender parity, that 50-50 split. Um, yep. Now, Ruth McGowan is, is a really, you know, really um, amazing advocate for this particular space, you know, and she she and um or she's encouraging women to run for uh for local government acknowledging that it's a tough job <laughs> but uh she states that women who seem to run have more electability than men yes Did you know this guys no it, it, that a greater proportion of women candidates actually get elected and, yes. and i think i think really julie and, and steve that's where we should be focusing in terms of the the proportionate numbers, not on mm. who gets elected, but the yeah. candidates. Uh, have we got um, a, a proper cross section of you know gender, ethnicity, yeah. all these things in the candidates? Mm. Because I think when we focus on who is elected, we're, we're we're now getting you know judgmental about you know which candidate was a better better candidate. I think the public will get it right if they get the option of a you know a genuine cross-section choice and we can encourage mm. um, um, candidates that or potential candidates that are not stepping forward either because they feel that there's uh, some economic disadvantage, there's some likelihood that they'll be harassed, that they'll face some discrimination, or there's something else that's holding them back from putting their hand up as a candidate. Um, with the Breaking Barriers report, there were four recommendations. I think a lot of the answers for me are in this educational issue around perceptions. Um, one of the recommendations is that, as you say, there's this concern about this perception of um, a negative perception about expenditure on child care expenses. And But the, I'm not convinced that you're going to solve, that the right way to solve it is by saying, we're not. We're going to hide the costs. We're not going to publish them. I just think that that's mm. an extreme solution. But I like this notion of you know promoting the equal utilization of childcare regardless mm. of of gender, um, and then you know uh, apply placing more resources into the sector um, to deal with this issue of online um, harassment, online bullying. I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not confined to local government. We know it's an issue in, in, in our schools, et cetera, but clearly, um, it's, it's having a detrimental effect on people yeah. at the, you know, at the, at the other end of it. Yeah. And it was interesting in this report, Steve and Tony, that, um, you know, they were sort of they were sort of saying, well, you know, who's responsible for this bullying behaviour? Um, and it was um, a combination discussion, councillors calling it out and the CEO calling it out as well um, and trying to, everybody working together because it's everybody's responsibility to try and manage, you know, this bullying behaviour. So interesting. Now, you know, they were talking about this structural reform that's coming. We know that that's in the wings, whether or not that's going to help. But the other thing they mentioned, um, which I think Ruth mentioned, was the uplifting of councillor allowances um, yes. because um, there was a question, I think, um, put by someone, Steve, I think, in the public about whether or not councils should get paid at all. Um, but anyway, yeah, interesting. There was a bit of input, Steve, wasn't there, from in this report? There's a bit of input from the community. I'm not sure about the report. Julie, but thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk about the input from the caller to ABC Victoria statewide. Um, uh, there was one phone call that was taken and um, I don't think the man realised, in fact, what he'd said and the, and the hidden messaging. Um, basically, the call was that this is all woke, that the La Trobe University has a woke agenda and how outrageous that a report could be based on 19 um, 
interviews, that notwithstanding that they're longitudinal. And I don't know, Julie and Tony, one of the things I think in life is I wouldn't be arguing with professors about the integrity of research. I tend to think that professors are pretty good about that. And if you think about research, um, professors Rupiner and Carson put their reputations on the line by publishing research. And that research, if it's peer reviewed, will stand until someone comes along with different research that comes to a different or sort of slightly varied conclusion. And I I sort of wonder about the hubris of someone that just would ring a radio show and then sort of claim that it's got no credibility. I, mean, I didn't take that very seriously and and just thought, you know, who is this fellow that, you know, you know, is is questioning, like you said, um, you know, robust research. Absolutely. <laughs> but anyway, you know, you take it with a grain of salt and oh, um, and you and you move on, don't you? <laughs> but isn't it the case that whenever we get an answer that we don't like, we leap to criticizing the research? Now, yeah. Tony and Julie, you've talked to councillors across the state, as have I, and candidates. In fact, I think of times where I know there are candidates who have researched into the culture of council organisations and decided not to stand. And yeah. so to the point that that caller made about let's elect the best person, well, one of the ways we're going to elect the best person is by removing those barriers and having, you know, giving opportunities for people to stand. Yeah. I think that's my kind of editorialising on the topic. I was going to say that the point that... Um... That it's a small sample, you know. There's there's a valid point in nine, 19 people interviewed out of you know 640 odd councillors. But yeah. the issue, but but I think that the rejoinder to that or the response to that ought to be, well, it's not just this report. I mean, no. we've had a culture survey. Mm. There's a there's a large number. So the data isn't simply coming from this report. So you know. Uh, potential when you look at the mathematics that that's a small sample of yes. of a of a much larger group of councillors admittedly yeah. but 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 i think that that what we're each saying today is uh, is drawn from an experience that is more than just this single report um and and you know we, there's a you know a lot of material in the culture survey about about councillors um or, or wanting to leave the role or having left the role mm. because yeah. they they feel um feel harassed and particularly in relation to um that online harassment which was yes. you know part of the focus of this breaking barriers report yeah now, Tony, and I, I, i've got to, and i've got to say steve i've got to say that even even one story of harassment and bullying to me is is not acceptable so whether it's one whether it's five whether it's 19 you know it you know it doesn't matter you know that the fact is we should not have it in local government it, we, we need to stamp it out and that's that's the point really I think um and so I think regardless of the numbers that have been interviewed the fact is that we've got multiple people that have experienced this and we don't want to see this in our sector because we want to attract really good candidates to run and to be champions for our communities. That's what we yes. want. And look, interesting that Ruth McGowan, her statement this morning, Steve and, and Tony, was really good. She's um, on LinkedIn said that as a counsellor coach, which she is, um, and, and Ruth is an ex um, yes. counsellor and an ex-mayor, so um, she's, she's really well versed in this space. Um, she uh, she says, I witness exceptional women leaders thrive in the challenging yet rewarding environment of local government. They find an opportunity to stretch themselves both professionally and personally. They relish the chance to engage with diverse groups of people and expand their networks in ways rarely possible as an ordinary citizen. Most importantly, many women appreciate the chance to give back to their communities. And she says that no state has yet achieved gender parity in local government representation. And here in Victoria, we need 1,000 women to stand to reach the state government's gender equality goal of 50-50 by 2025. So it's about getting 1,000 women to stand. And that's, I think, on the back of what Tony said before, getting that gender parity even at least to stand is a significant step forward. So... Um, so yeah. I was so excited to see this work come through and so excited to see um, some of the findings and what that means for us going forward. And hopefully, cross fingers, this message is getting out to some really 
um, uh, really uh, talented women across uh, different different local government areas to run for council. And and to Tony's point, Julie, the more exciting thing too is that if we create an environment where women are more inclined to stand, then other diverse groups will also have barriers yep. removed, you know, because of the nature of intersectionality, I suppose. Let's move on. Actually, thank you for that um, thorough summary too, Julie. Um, but on a slightly related topic, and maybe I'll throw to you on this one, Tony, um, Andrew Cooney, the CEO at the City of Greater Bendigo has um, published a rather excellent uh, media statement, and it's a pity it had to be published, um, just regarding um, elected representatives of staff and the inter and staff and the interactions with the community. Tony, yeah. So um, there at um, City of Greater Bendigo on the website, I, I read a statement from Andrew Cooney, the CEO, calling out um, disrespectful, inappropriate and cowardly commentary, well, I think the language you used, directed, this is commentary directed towards Greater Bendigo councillors, in particular towards the mayor. Um, a statement there that I absolutely agree with from the CEO was that councillors aren't fair game just because you're elected by the community. You're not just, you know, fair game to be criticised for, you know, your personal attributes, your physical attributes, your the way you talk, those sorts of things, just because you're an elected official. That's just yes. just just wrong and and not appropriate. And I think it's a a, a strong statement and a and a good statement. And I and I appreciate that there's a that there is a bit of angst in that community at the moment. It relates to um the expenditure of of money for councillors, the council of the mayor to, uh, and and someone to go on a trip to Portugal in Europe. And it's reasonable for the community to have an opinion about that. Absolutely. It's reasonable for the community to take a view as to whether that expenditure is appropriate or not. But um, I think what's being called out here or what I'd agree with here is that um, when the criticism falls into the personal and, uh, you know, the disrespectful rather than, you know, is there a better way we can spend this money? Is that well, what, what value are we getting out of that expenditure? Well, isn't the point too, Tony, that we could get excited about town planning, about um, capital works decisions, about service levels. There's a whole lot of things that people could get angry about. And I think Andrew's point's mm. pretty good, like play the issue, not the individual. Moving on from that and probably a related topic, um, Tony, you've been looking at the finally published report from the Mornington Peninsula Shire Council around um, Councillor Bissinger's suspension. Yeah, we mentioned this last week, didn't we, Steve and Julie? And uh, yes, it's been subsequently been made available, the Arbiter decision. Um, this is a decision interesting from, from Joel Silver, who not only is a barrister, but he's a former councillor and deputy mayor in the city of Glen Ira. So he's got some, you know, real... The highly respected Joel Silver, we could say, Tony. <laughs> That's right. And this decision's really about... Um, so ultimately, uh, councillor Susan Bissinger was found... Um, to have committed various misconduct offences. But the, the decision really relates to whether a councillor, in this case, Councillor Bissinger, reasonably knew the basis for the CEO imposing a staff councillor interaction protocol in relation mm. to her dealings with council staff. And therefore if she did reasonably know the reasons for that being imposed, was it dishonest and therefore misconduct for her to, if you like, encourage or not not correct at least public commentary, uh, i.e., you know, newspaper articles, um, TV interviews, radio um, um, interviews, emails from the community that were all suggesting or speculating that this council or staff interaction uh, protocol um, in, um, imposed upon Councillor Bissinger by the CEO that the was it um that that speculation and that was because of her you know non-PC opinion on an issue the flying of the intersex flag at civic offices um you know her her failure to correct that when she ought to have reasonably known the true reasons for this staff interaction protocol is what this decision is is really all about. So there were some key facts. There was a 
in September of last year, there was what was called an external mediation held um, at the council um, by a, a local government lawyer um, where um, councillor Susan Bissinger, councillor Steve Holland and the CEO, Mr Baker, all participated. And ultimately, um, the result of that um, mediation was a document called a mediation agreement or really a settlement agreement, if you like, which had a confidentiality clause in it um, that, and, and all the parties signed that. But the mediation itself arose because of um, concerns with Councillor Bissinger's use of emails, social media, her interactions with staff, including some emails that were sent about the flying of, of the intersex flag. But um, the purpose of the mediation was to avoid this more formal process mm -hmm. under the code of conduct provisions for a you know an ex, uh, you know a formal mediation through the principal conduct registrar or formal arbitration I should say through the principal conduct registrar so what then occurred um in terms of the arbitration itself there were 17 active allegations dealt with there and the arbiter found that seven of those allegations were all were, were proven um and found misconduct by Councillor Bissinger. And there were various situations where there was an unfounded claim promoted that this interaction protocol imposed by the CEO, the CEO has the right to do that. It's specific in the Local Government Act. Um, that that those um, that, un that unfounded claim that um, that interaction protocol arose from some particular opinion of Councillor Bissinger about flying a flag, um, that um, the fact that Councillor Bissinger didn't didn't um, correct that unfounded view, didn't and, and was seen to be promoting it in some interviews, etc., amounted to um, misconduct. And there were various instances of that. There were guest appearances on Three AW Radio. There was an appearance on. Um, on uh, on Sky News, there was articles in the local media. There were other findings of um, not no misconduct, so multiple allegations, and there were findings of no misconduct. To be fair to Councillor Bissinger, um, there were various comments that she'd made about um, about uh, events, about um, an, an email about membership of the Australian Local Government Women's Association, etc. That were, that were just regarded as robust debate. But the key here um, related to that notion of her her responsibility or to know um, the reasons for the imposition of the protocol. Now, there was some criticism, I, I guess, or, or in hindsight of the protocol, and one of the lessons I think for CEOs is it would be good when these if these protocols are introduced that there was is is a specific element of the protocol that gives the basis. Well, why is this occurring? What's this, if you like, a statement of reasons? Tony, were there any particular obligations by the arbiter that you think are worth raising? Yes, Steve, actually there, there were. And even in relation to some of the findings that of, of no misconduct in relation to some of the allegations. So, um, so, so for example, there were certain emails sent by Councillor Bissinger that were the subject of allegations, allegations of misconduct. You know, um, for example, there was an email chain where um, Councillor Bissinger described the council as woke. The arbiter said that they were rude and unprofessional. You know, it was rude and unprofessional language and it really shouldn't have been sent, but didn't amount to misconduct. It was just sent to an internal audience, not to the public at large, was directed towards council's decisions and not about the CEO or other councillors um, personally. Um, similarly, language about um, a, a, an email councillor Bissinger sent in response to an email from Councillor O'Connor about Councillor O'Connor intending to propose a motion concerning the voice to parliament referendum. And Councillor Bissinger's response was that our oh, council's already seen as woke and out of touch. Her language was rude, the arbiter found, but it focused on the issues, not the person, and therefore it was robust debate. And the final one I'd raise in relation to that, just because it's a bit um, 
a bit about popular music, Chris, uh, Julie, and, and and Steve. You you would listen to um, "Tub Thumping" by Chumba Wamba. Be one on your. That, that would be playlist, the I, Steve. That would be the I get knocked down, but I get up again. That's the <laughs> one, Steve. I reckon Chris is listening to that on his um on his. On his I cruise at the, the moment, again. not. Um, but um, so there was an email sent by Councillor Bissinger to all councillors, the CEO and a, and a council officer that included a YouTube link to this um, 1997 um, single by Chumba Wamba. And um, the applicant suggested that Councillor Bissinger was, by doing that, she was implying that her views are unfairly disregarded by her colleagues and that she just keeps fighting on and that. And this, and the arbiter said that that submission by the applicants was a bit uh, was a bit imaginative, that Councillor Bissinger had sent a stupid email without much thought. But again, um, um, it was not that the allegation wasn't didn't amount to misconduct. So the clear misconduct elements again are that um, need to acknowledge, correct that. Um, misperception in the community as to the reasons for the imposition of the council or staff interaction protocol protocol and some learnings I think in in future for governance officers CEOs in terms of drawing up those protocols having a statement of reasons would be helpful yeah Tony thanks for that that commentary Julie I know this is an area that's issued um, um interested you over a long period of time but isn't it a pity that just in the way that the council does its business or at the stage of mediation that it wasn't possible to address these earlier without going to the trouble and expense of an arbitration i know i know steve and you know obviously the council's gone to expense for mediation as well mm. you know so it's a double whammy in this circumstance you know it's just it is unfortunate but you know this seems to be a bit of a trend that's happening now um, across the sector, um, you know, these these costs will be targeted um, by communities. No doubt there are some, some communities out there that are um, concerned about um, this kind of behaviour and what this is costing the council. So, yeah, I'm, I'm concerned about it. But, look, um, out of this um, arbitration, what I'm quite um, uh, pleased about are some recommendations and some clear guidance in relation to uh, those interaction protocols, I think, because possibly um, they have not been sort of tested so much through these arbitrations. And so there's some good tips there for CEOs and governance officers to be able to um, have a look at and just finesse and um, make a little bit more watertight for um, for them to be more effective. So I think that's that's um, the good news that comes out of out of this one, even though we know that that kind of behaviour is not, you know, is not something that we want to see. But anyway. And and just a final okay. comment we should have um, there, Steve and Julie, is that maybe possibly this isn't the end of this one because um, the arbiter pointedly did ask Councillor Bissinger to or um, made a ruling that Councillor Bissinger should submit a draft apology. Yes. Now, Councillor Bissinger didn't submit a draft apology. She, uh, I believe she gave some reasoning, I think, which was, well, I'm not going to apologise for something I feel I didn't yeah. do. But but it was a it was a you know an interim order, if you like. Um, and so there's a question as to what are the implications for failing to comply with an arbiter um, requirement like that? Because if you look at the definition of serious misconduct in Section 3 of the Act, it, it one of the elements that makes it out is failure to comply with the, yeah. you know, the order of an arbiter. So potentially, right. arguably... Um, that's something that could be referred to a councillor conduct panel. Yeah, and Tony, mm. I know you've had an interest in the past in um, this topic of apologies that might be seen as somewhat disingenuous. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so I appreciate that no apology was given, and it was said, "Well, I can't because it would be. I don't feel, feel it was right. It would be disingenuous." But um, importantly, here, what happened was the arbiter requested the draft form of apology and 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 that request or if you like 
I say request, I think it was an, in fact, a, an order um, that wasn't complied with. So, you know, we'll just wait and see if there are any implications along those lines. Now, we've spent a lot of, isn't it a pity we've spent so much time talking about conduct and very little time talking about actually delivery of stuff. So I think we need to balance the scales somewhat. Um, so on a completely different tack, I saw a terrific LinkedIn post from Tammy Smith, uh, mm. the CEO at Yarra Ambiak during the week. And I know you saw that too, Julie, around the construction of um, of affordable housing. Yeah, I was really excited, Steve, because um, I'm I'm obviously planning is my background, and I'm really interested in the housing space. Uh, really interesting to see what councils are doing that are, is proactive in the housing space. And, you know, obviously, uh, councils in the UK are very much involved in in housing because they deliver a lot of housing. So, uh, but you know, isn't it great to see Yari Ambiak, um, you know, both both the CEO and the Mayor uh, announcing this week that they've officially handed over two of seven affordable housing units that they've currently planned planned or they've planned and they've currently constructed um, to uh, Dunmunkle Lodge, it's called. So they have um, constructed these units in Murtoa. Um, and tell me if I've... Murtoa. Oh, Murtoa, yeah. 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 Okay, good. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know Murtoa. Um, so possibly I just the scene... Sure I'll get this wrong, Julie. Then, possibly oh, the sorry. scene for filming of The Flying Doctors, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, okay. I need to go to Murtoa. Okay. This is the Wimmera Mallee um, footy league or actually, something like and, that. Actually, and... <laughs> In the interest of tourism in uh, in the Wimmer region, the stick shed at Matawa is worth a look. So yes, you do oh, need. To go, now I'm curious. So I'm I'm looking forward to getting an invite to go out to Yarri Ambiak sometime. Um, so anyway, look, um, yeah, so look, they, they're, they're recognising that they've had some support from the Murtoa Community Asset Committee of Council and the Victorian State Government uh, through the Regional Infrastructure Fund, which is, you know, great to see these kind of joint ventures happening with, you know, state government support. Um, uh, so what they're doing is they're also rolling out some other housing units in Woomalang. Wum Woomalang. Woomalang. Okay. Yeah. Right. In Warwick Nabil too, I think. Warwick, Warwick Nabil, Rapunzel oh, yeah. and Hopton. That's right, yeah. yeah. So, Sorry, I had to help you out, Julie. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so they've partnered with reputable people, you know, trusted a trusted not-for-profit aged care provider based in their shire, and they're now delivering these affordable housing units. Isn't that a great, isn't that a great contribution to the community? They must be very proud. And um, you know, they they, they deserve um, a mention. So yeah. good on good on you, Yari, Yari Ambiak. Uh, good on you, Tammy. Um, and congratulations to the councillors out there and Mayor Zanka. Yeah, and viable country towns are really important to our rural fabric. So I think that I hear, hear what you've said, Julie. I think it's terrific. Can I just also make a note, though, that re Regional Cities Victoria has identified that a lack of trunk infrastructure like water pipes and sewage plants is holding up the release of extra land and they are calling on government to directly fund this enabling infrastructure so more housing can be unlocked without driving up land prices. So a plug not only for that topic, but also for our regional council advocacy groups, I suppose, for the work that they do to enable this sort of thing to happen. Yeah, and I've been hearing more about this, Steve, recently, about this is a common challenge for, you know, these rural and regional councils, you know, um, and must be a bit of a frustration for the developers as well, I'd imagine. So, um, yep, you know, really good advocacy around that. Right. So it's not just planning red tape, Julie. <laughs> Let's move on. A couple of events are coming up, and I sort of mentioned before that the VLGA on the 20. 1st of March is hosting a global executive panel increasing on increasing gender equity in local government. I should have said that before, with panellists including Sam Plum, the Chief Executive of Westmoreland and Furness Council in the Lakes District, beautiful, in England, and Dr Grace Vickers, the Chief Executive of Midlothian Council, just south of Edinburgh. Um, yeah, about uh, gender equity and the global executive panels are inevitably a fabulous way to spend a couple of hours uh, of an evening. So details are on the VLGA website. The other one is that Fast Track, the annual councillor development um, day is next Friday, I believe, at the Melbourne Town Hall. Tony, are you on the speaking roster? Look, I I am the least um, interesting uh, panellist speaker there. <laughs> Let me tell you, uh, councillor 
Mia Shaw from Wyndham, the Mayor at Wyndham, Councillor Amanda Stone from Yarra, Councillor Trent Sullivan from City of Greater Geelong, um, Darren Ray, there's a name we all know, former councillor in Port Phillip who's involved yes. in the sector, Samuel Wilson from Swinburne, Cos Samaris, of course, very well known yes. political commentator. So um, on the topic of leading under pressure, that's the theme for the day. It's at the Melbourne Town Hall on the 15th of March. I think Sally Cap is doing the official opening as Mayor of um, City of Melbourne. So get along to that one, folks. Mm -hmm. I think there's still um, tickets available. Yeah, so, yes, there are a few last-minute tickets available, so uh, get in early, any councillors who are interested in going along to that. Can I actually, while you're talking about um, City of Melbourne, a bit of a segue, um, props to them because I had uh, reason um, to call their customer service team during the week and had a fabulous experience um, where the issue that I had was resolved pretty seamlessly. So, Good on them, nice to, and they don't know who I am. Um, but the other thing I did notice um, listening to the recording while I was waiting to speak to someone, they have a thing called View Your Fine um, that they advertise. And they say that if you get a parking fine, you can log on to the council website and view the photograph of the issue. And I think the words are something like before deciding what action you may choose to take. And I thought, what a great use of technology to streamline that interaction rather than someone just immediately, you know, calling the officer and having a rant. Mm. Mm, sounds great. Yeah, so, yeah, props to Melbourne City Council. Um, moving on to uh, arrivals and departures. Peter Stevenson's been reappointed as the administrator at Strathbogie Shire until October 2024. Tony, no great surprises there. No, so, of course, he was the, he appointed the interim um, administrator, um Back in uh, what well in in where when was it in December of last year um, for that three month period which essentially has just just expired and um, and now he's been um, appointed I think in the permanent role essentially uh, and we'll have councillors return in Strathbogie after the um, October elections this year and Julie one that's really interesting and I don't think anyone will have seen it pre anything like this previously, but I did see a report during the week of, of what's called the extraordinary case of the Queensland councillor seeking re-election while fighting a murder charge. Yes, Steve, and um, no doubt you've put this in the show notes and, um, you know, The Guardian has reported on this incredible sort of story. So um, I think, I think, Councillors and council staff should have a look at this one. Um, you know, it's a it's really interesting that um, you can be in this situation and still be running for council. It, it is, and sort of all those interesting ethical issues, Tony. Yeah, well, well, um, of course, not convicted yet, but I agree. It's unusual to see someone with such a significant charge running. Of course, if they were convicted, they'd be disqualified automatically. Let's say this council is suspended at the moment on full pay, $160,000 salary on full pay. Nice work if you can get it. Um, um, and uh, But he does intend to plead not guilty. So to be fair to, to him, it's um, Councillor Ryan Balden Lumsden in um, Gold Coast City Council. The, the election's on the 16th of March, so we'll know fairly soon Ooh. as to whether the... Um, constituents of his, I think they're called divisions up there, the wards, um, his divisions um, take uh, the view that he ought not be their representative with these charges hanging over him. Um, we'll, we'll soon find out what they think. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what numbers he gets to support him, bearing in mind he's got this hanging over his head. So it might damage him reputationally anyway um, where he may not get the support. So, you know, yeah, it's... Yeah, anyway, worth a read, I think. Worth a read. So as you said, mm. Julia, it's on the show notes. So that's just and about... Steve, sorry, I was just a bit, I can't be facetious. All the councillors watching this in Victoria will, will have just dropped their jaws when they heard the $160,000 you get paid as a councillor in the Gold Coast. Um, that's right. Makes our measly allowances um, look, look, yeah, look, look pretty insignificant. Mm. Yeah, I'll just remind people of the salaries, the executive salaries at the News Limited organisation before people get too excited. But anyway, mm -hmm. um, that just about winds things up. Um, Julie, uh, big week for you next week? 
Yeah, big week for me. Heading up to Wodonga next week, so really excited about that. I love the team up at Wodonga, so um, look forward to the to the road trip. And look forward to seeing you with Chris and Tony next week. Tony, you'll be uh, you'll be preparing for um, for fast track. I presume that'll take up a bit of your week. I just thought too, though, you being a Ballarat boy, maybe we should close um, on a sombre note, um, mm. noting. Uh, the tragic events in Ballarat, but also uh, giving a nod to um, Des Hudson for a terrific job. Yeah, yeah. So the, the as as the whole of Victoria, but particularly the Ballarat community over the last month or so, has been going through some really a traumatic time with the you know the disappearance, and now it seems that we we believe the tragic murder of Samantha Murphy, and um and and the Ballarat City Council. Um, has played a, a really significant role in in being a voice for the community um, in terms of how they can assist the search, um, speaking, you know, the truths that, that the community are feeling, speaking on behalf of the family at times and urging, you know, um, people to, you know, not speculate, et cetera. And Councillor Des Hudson, as the, the Mayor um, of Ballarat, has been everywhere he's been in the media constantly and I can imagine um it's been a significant load on him and his colleagues um as well at, at, at Ballarat Council but I think Des has been speaking really well from the heart really articulately and and um and congratulations Des and keep up the good work and we hope you get a, a bit of a break over the the long weekend. Yeah, well said, Tony. Here, here. Um, that's been the governance update uh, for this week. Chris Eddy uh, will be back next week uh, on the governance update brought to you by the Victorian Local Governance Association with the support of Hunt and Hunt Lawyers. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.